when the, when the IDW really blew up, you know, and, and we were all talking about the dangers of identity politics and wokeism and all this stuff, all the stuff that everyone's talking about now that has burst forth into the mainstream, there was a bunch of us, probably about 15 of us, you know, four or five years ago that were talking about it publicly um, and then all had various degrees of success as a group and then, and then singularly, right? And it was a really beautiful thing and we didn't even know what it was. And, the, and when Eric Weinstein, Brett's brother, coined the phrase intellectual dark web, it was sort of a joke. It was sort of silly, but it ga- at least gave us a rough name for these people that were just kind of willing to talk about stuff. It's been, it's been I would say, very, um, uh, I don't know if depressing is quite the right word. It, it, it's been a real eye opener for me to see what's happened with the IDW. So first, we should remove Jordan from the equation because Jordan obviously had health issues and I'm, I'm so thrilled that he's coming back. And as you said, I, I actually just interviewed him yesterday. We're going to post it on the day that the book comes out on March 2nd. But I spent two hours with him and uh, it was just so great to talk, talk to him again. And he's coming back and it's just so wonderful. But let's remove him for a second because you know he had to dip out because of health reasons. I would say Ben Shapiro on the, on the right side of the IDW, let's say, the right side politically, that he has maintained his popularity, continued to fight for the things he believes in, uh, open to different conversations, all that kind of stuff. Then, then there was sort of the more left-leaning plank, which I would say was Sam Harris, the, the Weinstein brothers, a couple other people. On the more right-leaning, I would say there's also Douglas Murray, who I, I absolutely think is one of the clearest, greatest thinkers that we've got. Ayan Hirsi Ali, her husband, uh, Niall Ferguson, a couple other, couple other people. And I would include myself on that sort of right-leaning part of it, let's say. I think what happened on the left-leaning part, and I think it's probably uh, most specifically pointed at Sam, and I guess this is what Brett was was getting at, is that Sam went so in on the anti-Trump stuff that he literally sent a tweet to Jack Dorsey saying, thank you for banning Trump from Twitter. And it's like, man, you know, all of us, we had all sorts of political disagreements without question, not only political disagreements, we had disagreements about the nature of reality and God and it, uh, the, the biggest existential issues you can imagine. But we agreed that that open inquiry, that free speech, fighting censorship, that these were the, the bedrock ideas that we should all be putting forth. And that's what made it so cool. That's why so many people were attracted to it, whether they were left-leaning or conservative or whatever it is. I think when Sam did a few things like that, I mean, look, if you're happy that Trump got uh, got booted from Spotify and the rest of these platforms. I mean, it's so ridiculous. It's like, who has more power, the, the president or the guy who allows the president to speak? Um, but to send out a tweet that basically says, thank you for censoring, um, you know, I think that sort that notion, this is not an attack on, on Sam personally, I've discussed it with him privately, but that very notion of like, oh, thank you, tech overlord, for taking out the guy that, actually never came for anybody, really, four years, didn't take out the media, didn't start any new wars, did a whole bunch of good stuff. I would say did actually relatively well considering COVID because he left it up to the states, which I think was the right thing to do. And if if Biden had all the answers that he said he would have, well, how come things are still not great now? Uh, The point is that's just a whole big complex problem that probably nobody has the perfect answer for. But I think the thing around free speech has really caused, that caused a real split. Um, so I sense there's a bunch of people that are kind of frustrated with Sam. It's, it's disappointing for me. Just for the record, I'd be willing, still be willing to sit down with any of the guys and gals and talk to them and have it out. But I think, I think the idea of the IDW as some sort of like card carrying group, um, which it never really was, right? Unless my laminated card got lost in the mail. Um, I think that that's kind of over at this point. And, and I'll just say one other thing on this. I would say that the right-leaning people on this have been able to make really nice inroads and make allies. I mean, look at me that I can say that Glenn Beck and Dennis Prager and Ben Shapiro and Larry Elder, that these people who I have some political disagreements with, it's becoming less and less, but I've been able to build all sorts of cool bridges over there. Well, show me, show me any instance of one of the left-leaning people being able to build a bridge with the wokesters. Guess what? Zero evidence of it. That wasn't a white power sign. That was zero evidence of it. So I want to go to where the conversations are. I want to go to where the fertile ground to build things is. And to me, I see that on the on the right side. On one of your p- previous appearances on this podcast, um, we discussed the moment Sam Harris uh, turned in his IDW card 
and <laughs> you said on on this podcast um though he didn't mention me by name i think that's what he was aiming at he was angry at me and probably had some right to be you said that you hoped you'd be able to have a sort of constructive conversation um around the topic and you know move forward together did that ever happen no it didn't happen and i must say um whatever responsibility i felt for the falling out with sam i no longer feel uh that responsibility that i did feel came from the fact that heather and i were asked a question in our live q a about sam and i don't think we were as careful as we should have been um i don't think we said anything terribly wrong but you know we used the term trump derangement syndrome anyway if i could go back i would undo it mm. um, but i apologized for it which yeah. i think was sufficient what unfolded around covid though was of a very different nature and it wasn't just covid it was covid and the uh the last presidential election in which sam took the position that there was only one thing to do and anybody who talked about anything else was in some way guilty of putting us all in jeopardy um, because of the magnitude of the threat that he felt trump represented I didn't see it that way. We're both Americans. We're entitled to differ over this. And I can't see, you know, let's put it this way. I have a standard that I, I know could be abused in somebody else's hands, but I know that I use it carefully. And the standard is, could reasonable people disagree over this? Hmm. Right. And my sense is, could reasonable people disagree over whether or not Trump is such a tremendous threat uh, that we have the right to contemplate something other than voting for whatever the blue team has delivered. Yeah. Reasonable people could differ over that. And Sam did not believe reasonable people could differ over that. He believed you were inherently unreasonable if you differed over it. Mm -hmm. That happened again with COVID. Now, the thing that troubles me very deeply here is that Sam has been very aggressive in was very specifically attacking my credibility and Heather's credibility as scientists, right? He's saying, look, you, he admits that he is not qualified to evaluate what took place during COVID, but he says, neither are Brett and Heather. Now that is not true. Are we qualified as virologists to discuss virology? No. But evolutionary biology is a central player in all of the disciplines that were relevant to the pandemic. We were squarely within our training to discuss it. And even if we hadn't be, the, the fact is the way uh, this works is you train yourself, right? In my opinion, getting a PhD might be something you have to do, but getting two is unnecessary because even if you want to switch topics, once you've figured out what the level of work necessary is, you can train yourself in a new topic. So in any case, the question was, were we in a position to meaningfully sort signal from noise in the pandemic? And Sam thought no, but Sam was wrong about virtually everything. And so my point is, what kind of intellectual discovers that whatever model they are running has led them astray across the board and then does not go back and especially when you're talking about a friend does not go back and correct the record with respect to attacks on someone else's credibility who was not wrong across the board right in fact was disproportionately right and to the extent that you say well Geez, who's to say that you were disproportionately right? The fact is, Sam, I believe, has publicly said that he's not getting any more COVID boosters, right? Sam has switched teams, and he has not owned up to it, right? He swore that these things were so safe and so effective and that that was so clear from the evidence that had been presented to us that people were effectively betraying the collective not to get the shots 
and that Heather and I were irresponsible for discussing concerns about hazards down the road that we did not yet know about. But we turned out to be right. Those hazards exist. There's a, uh, the data is polluted by corruption, but there's a very strong signal in the data that suggests that more people were harmed than helped by these shots. Even if you don't believe that is true, there were certainly a huge number of people harmed needlessly because we didn't age stratify the recommendation for the shots. So the, the degree of wrongness of Sam's position is extreme and his failure to own up to it uh, is clear evidence of a deep characterological flaw. So, um, and the fact that he won't talk to me about it is evidence that he knows that. Do you see a sort of any route to reconciliation here or on your side, are you willing to have that talk? Are you willing to have that conversation? Of course. And, you know, I have a rule. Um, I'm not going to out the person at the moment, but uh, some years ago, I had my first conversation with somebody quite famous uh, on a topic that was unrelated to what had happened at Evergreen. But the first thing this person said to me um, was, hey, I feel like I owe you an apology. When Evergreen first happened, um, I thought you were the bad guy. I thought you were telling stories about what was taking place that wasn't true. I, I misunderstood it. And it took me years to realize I had it wrong and I'm sorry. And what I said to this person was actually by my scheme, you don't owe me an apology, right? All I can ask is that you try to figure out what's true. And if at the point you discover that you had it wrong, you put it right, right? If you fix it, then you and I are square, right? What I don't tolerate is people who don't fix it, who get it wrong and then rationalize or throw up dust or whatever they do. And so anyway, yeah. Does Sam have the capacity to put this right? hundred percent. All he's got to do is own up to what happened and how it happened, right? We're good from, from there. Um, but until he does that, this is, this is going to be, this is going to hang over us. It's the central fact of our relationship until he puts it right. And I hope he does. I miss Sam. I like Sam. I think he was an important force for good. And, and uh, I'm not happy to see him tangling himself in knots, rationalizing uh, a departure from reason that um, many people were very troubled by. Hmm. So anyway, Sam, if you're out there, call me. Let's talk. I just wonder what your relationship is is like with with Sam now, and and how you see really what happened with this whole fallout of the IDW. Right. Uh, so Sam and I uh, were always very friendly. We've yeah. communicated by email, you know, many times. We we've met in person. We've gone to dinner. Uh, he's he he invited me uh, to his show many years ago, and so it's not. It's not as though we were best friends, but we knew each other. We respected each other. We knew of each other's uh, positions on many things. And so, yeah, he's, he's a great guy. I mean, on 95% of things, uh, you know, I I would have been his, his big fan. Then I faced a bit of a conundrum. Uh, this, I'm answering my the question of my own relationship with Sam. And it really, it, it truly is nothing personal. I, it's really important for all the, the folks out there to know it's, I don't have time to sit and, you know, do personal gossip stuff because there are bigger issues at play. So what are some of those issues? I have a personal code of conduct. Maybe it's just the Gatsad code of conduct. Maybe it's partly the Middle Eastern code of conduct where, you know, honor and shame are really important in my calculus, right? So uh, because Sam and I knew each other for many, many years, I bit my tongue as I saw him you know, taking positions that to me seemed quite insane uh, because I was driven by the code of conduct of don't go after your friends. Uh, 
But then that, the conundrum arose because then that was pitted against the deontological defense of truth, the, 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 you know, pathological need to be authentic. So then I thought, but am I not then being inauthentic if I hold my tongue when someone, yes, whom I know, whom I like, who's a lovely guy, is espousing pure shite, okay? So then I started coming out of the woodwork, but I did it in a jocular way, right? So I would I would satirize some of Sam's positions. Now, I thought he might say, ha-ha, gag, you got me, and we'd go back and forth and rib each other. He went a different route. He first unfollowed me. Now, does it matter to me? Do I stay up at night saying, why, Sam, why did you unfollow me? No, but that's a dishonorable act coming from someone from the Middle East. Then he blocked me, right? Now, he could have easily said, then eventually he left Twitter, right? Now, he could have easily said, hey, why don't you come on my show and let's hash out our differences? Or, hey, why don't I come on your show and let's hash out our differences? So now let's talk about the issues that, in my case, I know that with Sam and Brett, it was the COVID stuff, mm. but let's talk about a, a much broader set of issues that really pissed me off. Okay, let me explain now the important distinction between deontological ethics and consequentialist ethics, which I cover in The Parasitic Mind, my previous book. Deontological ethics are absolute truth. So if I say it is never okay to lie, that would be a deontological statement. A consequentialist statement would be, is it, uh, it's okay to lie if there is a greater goal that comes from it, uh, right? Uh, if you, I, I often joke, although it's true, if your spouse says, do I look fat in those jeans, then put on your consequentialist hat really quickly and say, absolutely not. You've never looked more beautiful and therefore you will have a happy and long marriage, okay? So for many, many things, we are all consequentialists and it makes perfect sense. But when it comes to inviolable principles that define the West and the greatness of the West, those are deontological by nature. They have to be. So for example, freedom of speech is a deontological principle. The second that you say, I believe in freedom of speech, but dot, 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 then you're an asshole. Okay. Now, freedom of speech is not absolute in the sense that you can't defame, you can't incite violence. But short of that, it should be an absolute deontological principle, meaning that I am a Jewish person who went through the Lebanese Civil War. I support the right of Holocaust deniers to spew the most offensive and insulting thing possible, which is to deny the mass extermination of an entire people. In a free society, you have to tolerate assholes, okay? So Sam comes along, you know, the guy who wrote a book on morality, you know, the guy who wrote a book about lying and how it's not good to lie. And then he said, oh, I'm all about freedom of speech, but surely not for Orange Himmler. That's my colorful way of saying Donald Trump. So yes, I completely support. Well done, Jack Dorsey, the former CEO of Twitter, for taking away the sitting president of the United States because freedom of speech cannot be something that we promote for someone as dangerous as the hurling, to use his words, I'm maybe slightly, he, he's a he's a asteroid hurling towards Earth. In that case, all bets are off. So that's the ontological violation number one. I believe in freedom of speech, but not for Donald Trump. Story number two. Oh, I'm all about presumption of innocence. Yes, yes, that's all good. But not for Brett Kavanaugh, the guy who's going to become Justice Smith, because we can't, I mean, yes, we don't have any concrete proof that he's a gang rapist that went up and down the eastern seaboard of the United States raping everybody in sight. We don't have any proof. But in his case, you know, this this is a job interview for to become justice minister. So we can't afford him the courtesy of presumption of innocence. Okay. Story two. Story three. Oh, I completely believe in journalistic integrity and of telling the truth but not when it came to Hunter Biden's laptop. 
because in that case, it makes perfect sense for the entire media and all social media platforms and governmental to try to suppress that story because if they hadn't done that, then Donald Trump would have become president and we couldn't have had that. So in that case, it made perfect sense to suppress the story, which of course we now know was completely true, was not Russian disinformation, okay? And story four, which relates to Brett Weinstein and his COVID conflict with Sam. Sam went on, as you know, very famously on trigonometry and several times since, where he said, and here I'm gonna, even before I say what he said, I'm going to use an Arabic expression translated in English, but it also exists in other cultures. If my grandmother had balls, we would have called her my grandfather. So here's Sam. If I hadn't been wrong about every single thing I said about COVID and had everything about COVID been the way I had said it would should come out, then I would have been right. So you see, I would have been right, right? So I'm, I'm being facetious in how I say it, but it's literally that. Just You just have to go and watch it, right? So that to me is hubris. It's, it's saying the reason why the seven deadly sins have pride as the number one of, of the root of all seven deadly sins because all the other deadly sins stem from pride, from self-love. I will never admit to being wrong. I'm speaking now as, as Sam. That pissed me off. And so to me, it has nothing to do with, with Sam as a person. He, I'm sure he remains a lovely guy. And tomorrow, if he called me and said, hey, you know what? I actually listened to your points and I, I think you may be on something. Let's hash it out. I would say, let's do it. Now, all these idiots online speaking about hate, they like, oh, it's a personal thing. Gad is upset because his book didn't sell as much as Sam. Well, first of all, I don't know if that's true, but... I mean, do you really think that that's who I am? Or do you think what I just explained to you is what the reason is? So to me, the reason why I went after Sam is because he is a person who has great ideas, who is respected in the intellectual ecosystem. And therefore it would be inauthentic for me to not attack his positions when I think those positions are worthy of attack. And I regret the fact that that may have affected I don't want to say friendship because it's not as though, you know, we were hanging out with each other every Tuesday, but I don't like to have bad blood with people. I certainly in my heart, I hold no ill will towards Sam, but I think he has gone down the, uh, the abyss of infinite lunacy.